Hello, and uh, a very warm welcome to the Potato Showcase Week. I'm Jane King, uh, the CEO of the Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board, and it's an absolute privilege to be opening uh, this virtual event and uh, to see so many of you dialing in. I can see all the numbers piling up, which is great to see. Um, so we usually gather at this time uh, each year uh, with events um, all across the country, right on farm. And uh, this year we're trying to find new ways uh, to meet you and to uh, to gather due to the COVID-19 virus. And uh, digital definitely seems to be a good route uh, for many growers. Um, you can listen in as it's happening, uh, like today, or you can download the recordings later at a time to suit you. So, um, and this showcase is running from today up until end of play on Thursday, and lots and lots of meaty content for you. AHDB's Knowledge Exchange team have pulled together a really great week of programs, um, a useful showcase of the services and the work of our teams, but very importantly also all the innovations happening in technology and developments in the strategic farm network. And today we're covering uh, market updates, including a look at the European market from my old chum uh, and colleague Cedric Porter. And uh, of course, the timing for all this is absolutely ideal. We've got with, uh, with business really being uh, uh, far from easy for the potato industry. Um, and therefore information at this time uh, and being able to talk to each other uh, share insights and unasked questions is absolutely critical. It, it's been uh, an unprecedented period for growers. And I know you've heard that many times, but it really has been an extraordinary time. A very tough last three months in so many ways uh, for the potato sector, uh, with the shutdown of the, the food service sector um, and really the hospitality industry almost coming to a complete and utter uh, end for, for a, a period. Um, and to top it all, um, a very testing winter even before that, uh, with extremely wet conditions. Um, and in some markets, there are a few crops uh, moving out of stores and uh, we've got another uh, harvest lo looming. In addition, we've got um, some significant changes coming right across the industry in terms of new agricultural policy on its way, uh, farm support ultimately disappearing, um, and a challenging competitive uh, landscape uh, and indeed some new measures coming in around uh, our management of the environment. So HDB's work uh, has always been about really making the most of our independence um, and being able to help every farm uh, take control in this changing landscape and, and reach their, their full potential. And so one of the key things we're going to be showing you today in our webinar is the coverage of, of, of the market with the first planted area results for the 2020 season from our senior analyst, um, Alice Bailey, who's going to talk you all through that. They've only just been released. And uh, of course, we know that, that some of that news uh, isn't necessarily going to be what you want to hear. Uh, not, it's not all good news. Uh, but as always, it's you're better off knowing and having the facts at your fingertips, which is what we're going to try and do for you today. Um, so my only other plea really is to encourage you to make the most of the levy, use the information and resources that are available to you. We're finding a phenomenal number of farmers and growers able to access our services now through digital um, because we've had to convert a lot of our activity online because we can't do uh, the face-to-face -face at, at this time. And what's really interesting, particularly things like through our strategic farm events, is that through delivering them online, we're reaching lots and lots of new growers who perhaps in the past wouldn't have actually physically come along to an event. So that's really, really fantastic. So if you enjoy today and you enjoy the programs of this week, do spread the, spread the word and um, uh, tell your friends and encourage others to to get involved so that just leaves me to um say a few thank yous um thank you to all the team uh, that's put this week of of showcase tip together um all our excellent lineup of speakers you've got some cracking speakers today um who, who's going to give you some really important insights 
And most important of all, thank you to all of you uh, for joining in. I hope you enjoy the week and do, as always, let us know what you think of the week and also all of our service at AHDB. We're constantly on a, a, a real journey to continue to improve and be as relevant and as helpful as we can to you. So give us the feedback, what's and all. It's very important to us. Um, so that just leaves me now um, to say goodbye from me and to hand you over to my colleague, Amber Barton, for a little bit of housekeeping. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, I'm just going to run through housekeeping with you very quickly. Um, I want you to know that you're all muted and we can't see any of you, so don't worry. Um, all questions for the speakers, um, and if you're having any technical issues, if you could just go to the questions tab um, on the box that you should see on your right hand side and just type anything in there, myself and Christian will um, be able to help you with any technical issues. Um, and get your questions ready to be asked to all of our speakers uh, at the end. Uh, also, we've got basis and the ROSO points for today's webinar. So if you could just put your name, your postcode, your date of birth and your basis and the ROSO number in that questions tab as well, uh, then we'll make sure that we get you the basis and the ROSO points that are available. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on the HCB YouTube uh, channel afterwards. Uh, if you're joined today, we'll send you a link around so that if you want to watch it again and go into any of the content, you can do. Uh, if, if, if for any reason you know someone who hasn't been able to join today, uh, we can send the link out as well. So don't worry about that. Um, as Jane said, if you've got any feedback um, on this webinar or on any content uh, that you think we should be covering for future webinars, then please do get in touch. I think that's everything. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Alice Bailey and she's going to talk us through. Oh, there we go. I've missed that. <laughs> um, no, sorry. Yeah, I'm going to hand over to Alice Bailey. She's going to talk us through domestic market updates um, and the 2020 planted area estimate. Uh, then we'll go to Cedric, um, who'll give us an EU market update and what uh, the COVID uh, effect has had has been on the global potato trade uh, before Nicola Dodd, uh, our marketing manager at AHDB, talks us through the recent marketing activity. So over to you, Alice. Thanks, Amber. So, yeah, just to introduce myself, I'm Alice. For those of you who have not met me or seen me speak at other events, I'm a senior analyst in the market intelligence team in the HDB and I'm going to give a bit of a domestic overview of what's been going on because like Amber said Cedric will come on to the European side of things. So let's get started please Amber. Next slide Amber. Thank you. So where were we pre-lockdown? Every year we release a end of March stocks report um which pretty much coincides with the start of lockdown for this year at the end of march this year it was estimated that there was around 1.19 million tons still in store in grower ownership so that doesn't actually include anything that packers or processors already hold it's only in grower ownership that is 20 percent higher than the same point last year and five percent more in store in grower ownership than the five-year average the rate of drawdown, which means the um, movement of potatoes from grower ownership from end of January to end of March has also been slightly slower this year compared to previous years, and that's 2% below the average or five-year average. So yeah, next slide. In terms of a sector breakdown, how did that look? The top two sectors, which is packing or pre-pack and processing, both sat well above the same point last year. So the orange bars on this graph uh, represent the end of March 2020 stocks and the green ones are 2019. The blue sort of hashed bars, they represent the five year average. So we can see for pre-pack and processing that it's at significantly, stocks that significantly above the previous season, but also above the five year average. Now for the chipping sector, it did sit um, marginally, so 2% above March 2019, um, in, at the end of March 2020, but this did sit below the five-year average by 11%. Now that 
might seem a good thing, but for many of you, I'm sure you're fully aware that we pretty much lost the whole of the shipping sector in terms of market as at the end of March for at least a couple of weeks. Um, and it's not really returned fully, but we'll come on to that. So although that looks like you know we were in a better situation, um, this is as at the end of March, so before the real effects of the coronavirus were felt. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to have a quick look now and um, talk you through the demand trends throughout lockdown. So what's happened pretty much since those end of March stocks um, surveys. Next, please. So we'll start with where um, where food and drink was consumed. It's probably it's no surprise to anyone that the typical week pre-lockdown saw a significant amount more out of home consumption than once we were in lockdown. Now that doesn't necessarily mean the eating out market as such, um, meaning like restaurants and what have you. This just means not eating and drinking within the home. So it can be in the office, at the park, etc. So obviously we've seen a big movement in where people are consuming their food um, and drinks. And by no surprise to anyone, this biggest rise was found in lunchtime meals, as obviously a lot of those are consumed in offices, etc. Next slide, please. So after looking at where they've been consumed, it's kind of what consumers' views are on food. And we can see, so this, um, the line graphs and um, the bar charts are in the middle of this slide. You can see that people have generally been more interested in cooking and trying different things. So there's been an increase in sorry, trying different um, new dishes and increase in scratch cooking as well, and also using up leftovers. As you can see, there's a few other changes where people have increased their sort of movement around food or cooking um, as well throughout lockdown. Another key point is that there was a bit of a shift in what people look for um, when buying potatoes. So we can see that a third of consumers in the YouGov and AHDB um, survey, a third of consumers say that the usage date has had more importance in recent months than it used to. Now, Recently, I think it was Tesco's released an article that suggested that more um, they had fewer shoppers or shoppers came less often to their store, but the basket size increased. So essentially, consumers are shopping less often, but buying more products at each sort of shopping outing. So therefore, it's no surprise really that the usage date has become um, more of something that people watch out for you know if they're buying more then they want it to last until the next time they go shopping which ultimately they're doing less so there's been a bit of a shift in the way people engage with their food and their and the way that they cook but also in the sorts of important things to them next slide please so now i'm going to move into so we've looked at sort of what people's views are around food um, throughout lockdown, where they're consuming it. But now let's have a look at the sort of demand as to where the demands are coming from. So starting off here, this graph shows um, retail demand. So it shows the, it's Kantar data that shows the sort of volume of sales compared to the previous year for both frozen potato products and fresh potatoes in retail. So the blue line there represents um how frozen potato product sales are comparing to the previous year and the green line is fresh potatoes and i've marked on there when lockdown happened so it's clear to see there that and we all you know know it was going on there was a big spike in demand in the run-up to lockdown with the so-called panic buying and we know that was happening across a lot of different product ranges but potatoes did fall into that and not only in retail did we see this big spike of demand for potatoes, but we also saw it um, in sort of the wear market for 25 kilo bags from both farm shops and also direct from farm gate. A lot of growers were reporting that there were um, the general public were just turning up at the end of the drive or in the farmyard asking if they were selling potatoes. So we did see a big spike in the run up to um, to lockdown for demand for fresh potatoes throughout it we've seen it calm down since then but it has remained above um, last year throughout the last three months the only time that fresh potatoes slipped below last year was in april we can see there only slipped three percent below last year 
but it's key to note here that that was actually the weekend of Easter last year. And we often see demand for potatoes rise a little bit in the run up to Easter with the amount of roast dinners, um, et cetera, that are being cooked for Easter. So really we've seen demand for both fresh potatoes and frozen potato products through the retail lines remain pretty strong. Next slide, please. So having had a look at retail, it's time to have a look at food service. Unfortunately, it wasn't such a rosy picture for the food service sector and for those that supply to it. At the end of March, we almost had complete loss of the food service sector and the processing um, and shipping sectors were definitely the hardest hit here. Yes, takeaway services were able to continue, but Unfortunately, this wasn't something that was easily done by everybody involved in the food service sector. So we saw obviously pubs and restaurants completely closed down, but all of those couldn't necessarily just switch easily into takeaway services either. We have seen some be able to develop into this, um, but it has taken some time for the industry to find its feet. Chip shops as a whole, pretty much all closed down as around the 20th of March. And for a few weeks, we pretty much saw a loss of market, which I'll come on to. Many um, chip shops have started to reopen, but um, it did take some time for chip shops to be able to adjust into sort of the new ways of working within the rules and regulations that the government set out. Yes, they are obviously a takeaway, but generally they're not ones where you ring up an order um, and often they're not a delivery service either. So it took some time for them to develop how their business was able to function um, with the new rules and regulations. And we can see here on the bottom left graph that the takeaway sort of sales avenue only makes up 5% of volumes of sales in 2019 anyway. So even though takeaways could continue, it was at limited capacity. And the four, I mean, the food service makes up different, um, a different amount of the market for both processed or fresh potatoes and processing, especially it's around 55 to 60% of processed potato sales is through the food service avenue. So it's no surprise that that was the hardest hit sector, um, along with, like I say, chipping, because many chip shops have, were forced to close. Next, please, Amber. So like I said, talking about the chipping side of things, this graph represents the um, bag price for chipping um, from over in the east. Now this is free by prices, um, free by X farm prices. We can see there that um, at the point of lockdown, there was pretty much a total loss of market. The price didn't just crash out for growers, the price actually disappeared. It wasn't that it was rock bottom, it was that there just was it was difficult to sell. You could hardly find anywhere to actually sell your potatoes to at all. So it pretty much disappeared rather than crashed to rock bottom. The sector, like I say, it has started to um, find its feet again. And it's said that 95% of shops have reopened. However, these are at limited, um, limited opening hours, limited volumes, limited footfall. So as much as 95% of shops may have reopened, Unfortunately, it doesn't mean 95% of demand has returned. Yes, we have seen some demand return after the first few weeks, but it is generally fairly limited. And as we can see, it has pressured prices um, considerably compared to where they were pre-lockdown. In terms of catering and food service, so this is more so for the processing market, we pretty much completely lost that as well. The loss of catering hasn't really returned. And although some quick serve restaurants, et cetera, have started to reopen, this has still had a big effect on the free by market as 96% of the planted area in um, 2019 for the processing market was under contract. And therefore many contracts couldn't be utilized through the, the beginning of lockdown when those areas were closed. And so now it's likely that it's mostly contracted material that is being utilized um, into those sorts of avenues. Next, please. So what's happened in the packing market? We saw that there was retail, uh, good retail demand from the point of 
um, lockdown. However, there was some chipping material. So for those that were um, at a loss of market, there was the opportunity to, opportunity to be able to sell into the packing market if specifications could be met. And as we can see that this, well, well, we know that was happening. There was movement of chipping material where possible into the packing market. And this did bring those low end prices of packing material down. So this graph sorry, represents the English packing white uh, free by Exxon price. So we can see that um, the presence of chipping material where specs could be met did obviously lower the bottom end of the market. And um, however, the top end of the market has remained relatively firm, but this is for really top quality material for those premium packing lines. Um, that I mean, shipping material isn't going to be able to sort of dig into anyway. Generally, though, for the last um, month throughout June, we've heard from the trade that demand has, or free by demand, sorry, has been relatively flat um, for the month, with a lot of contracts being trying to be cleared up um, and the sort of new crops sort of creeping in very slowly with the new potato market. Um, but as a general rule, it kind of felt it found its new normal and has sort of steadied out somewhat. Next, please. So taking a look into the future um, for the 2020 season, obviously nobody has a crystal ball, unfortunately, and no one can be sure of exactly how the next few months are going to pan out. We can't be certain that we are out of the woods and lockdown will continue to ease off. There's, def there's no definitive answer that there's not going to be a second lockdown, um, but we can have a look as far as we can and try to plan accordingly. Next, please. So for those of you that didn't see the release on Friday, this has recently come out. It's our first estimate for the 2020 planted area. So this is estimated at 119,000 hectares, and this is across all sectors, which at the same time as a releasing this, it meant we were allowed, able to revise our 2019 planted area estimate now that we've had more levy returns in since publication in September. So that was revised at 120,000 hectares, which means that the 2019 area is looking at a 1% drop from the previous season. Now, if that doesn't seem very dramatic considering we lost several markets um, at the point of planting. However, it was realistically too late for intentions to be changed significantly. There was rental agreements, inputs, um, commitments were made basically. And for many growers, they were already growing more spring crops or spring cereals, beans, et cetera, than they may have wanted to anyway, because of the wet autumn and winter that we had, it meant that autumn drilling wasn't as successful as one would have hoped. So, Really, it came too late for people to be able to change their um, intentions, which is why we may not have seen such a significant drop. If we were to reach 45 tonnes per hectare, this could mean we're facing a production of 5.4 million tonnes for the 2020-21 season. Now, I don't think 45 tonnes per hectare is unrealistic either. This actually sits um, above the 2018 yield, but actually below the average yield for last year, which was 45.6 tonnes per hectare. This also sits below the five year average um, of 46.2 tonnes per hectare. So if we take a ballpark figure of 45 tonnes per hectare yield, that's what production we could be facing. Next, please, Amber. The demand outlook, unfortunately, isn't massively pretty either, like Jane alluded to. Um, unfortunately, it's not all great news, but it is something we do need to be aware of. We are facing the biggest recession since the 1940s, and we are going to be experiencing recessionary behaviors in consumers across all sectors of life, basically. Um, when furlough ends in October, we're likely to see a rise in unemployment and therefore a drop in income. And ultimately, that means that consumers have less money to be able to spend. Fortunately, potatoes aren't deemed as a luxury product. Um, generally, they're seen as quite a filling and economic meal, which is, you know, good news in terms of recessionary behaviours. 
and also non-premium frozen products are also seen as quite good value. It's likely because of this um, that we're going to see retail be the key driver in demand for some time, and we're likely to continue continue to see strong demand for um, sort of the retail side of things, be it frozen products, frozen processed products, or um, fresh potatoes. However, unfortunately for um, the food service sector, this will take longer to return to normal. Not only do recessionary behaviours mean people don't have um, as much money, so therefore, unfortunately, they might have to cut back on eating out, but also we're going to continue to see um, social distancing measures in place. So even if restaurants, pubs, etc., are at full capacity, then new full capacity is likely to be less than what that old full capacity used to be pre-coronavirus. So even though people might want to still go out, they might not be able to afford um, to eat out quite so often. But on the plus side, looking at previous recessions, it seems that takeaways are deemed as almost a necessity. They're seen as a, um, a luxury throughout recession to keep people going. So hopefully we will still see that side. One thing to note though, is that contractor material is likely to be utilized first, um, obviously above free buy, free buy will be seen as more of top up supply. We haven't been able to um, do a contract free buy split of what the planted area looks like at this stage because the first estimate is only at 60% of levy returns. But once we do the full split later on in the season, once we get more returns um, in, we're able to have a look at what that split looks like. Thanks, Amber. The, so all in all, as a summary, demand is looking like we're likely to see continued demand on the retail side of things. Um, however, with food service being under some pressure still in terms of demand, it's processing into the shipping sector that are likely to continue to be slightly pressured, unfortunately. And the free buy market is like I say, likely to be top up supplies as contract supplies are used first, which could um, add a little bit of pressure to prices going forward for the short to medium term. In terms of the area estimate, 119,000 hectares are all up, and that's down 1% from the previous year. Like I say, we will revise this estimate later on in the season when we hit the usual 90% of every returns. And at that point, we'll be able to do the full breakdown um with market sector and region and also this is at the point we can have a look into whether it's contracted or free buy thanks very much brilliant thank you very much Alice um I just want to point out as well if you are putting questions into the question box if you just uh say who the question's for it'll make it easier for me at the end to uh, dish them all out um, so thank you Alice uh, really insightful look at what's going on um, and what could be going on in the near future uh, welcome, Cedric. So I'm going to hand over to you now, and um, yeah, let's let's see what you have to say about EU markets. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Amber. Uh, so I'm Cedric Porter. I'm the editor of uh, World Potato Market. So I don't work for the AHDB. So anything I say uh, that's controversial, I don't know, is it, can be accounted to the AHDB or me. Depends what I say. Uh, so if I can have the next slide, please. That's uh, World Potato Markets. Uh, and if we just go on to the next one, World Potato Markets, a weekly newsletter on production, um, pricing and uh, trade of potatoes, potato products around the world, read by uh, people across the world, um, uh, across Europe, uh, North America and beyond. Um, so, yeah, if we go on to the next slide, please, Amber. So um, I think arguably coronavirus had a bigger impact on the EU potato market than in in the UK. And I think the diversified nature of the UK market has, has actually been quite useful for it. The fact that um, a significant amount of uh, potatoes go for the packing table market uh, uh, as well as the processing market. Some other markets in, in the EU are quite reliant on the processing side of things. Uh, and they've been um, particularly hit. Uh, so yeah, if we go on to the next one. So yeah, that, that's just looking at the prices there. So uh, the right-hand one, we've, we've seen a version of that before. That's the uh, weekly uh, average free buy. So sort of holding steady, it's probably a slight uh, downward trend, but you look on the uh, the left, 
the the, the that's the average um, uh, free buy price for uh, potatoes or mainly processing potatoes in Belgium and you see that blue line there sort of hovering around just under 150 uh, and then starting to plunge uh, in March uh, and then really a gap when there was no real fruit free buy market at all uh, during April and May uh, and then re returning at the end of May uh, at a much lower price of around about 30 euros a ton uh, there, the the the, uh, the average free free buy price, so dropping from 150 at one point to to uh, around 30 euros a ton. So yeah, if we have the next one. So yeah, these uh, the uh, retail. Uh, this is um, uh, across the world, really. We've seen these sort of uh, scenes of uh, shelves being stripped bare of spuds. Uh, I've seen pictures like this in America. Uh, across Europe as well so um, so you know from from that point of view people did turn to their spuds uh, in lockdown uh, which which uh, you know there, there is some good news uh, some perhaps some longer term good news from that so yeah on to the next one so this is the increase in potato sales we've got those um, you've seen those in more detail the first two there the UK uh, figures that the AHDB have been running with Kantar uh, and I have to say they have been very useful uh, um, to, to, to for tracking the market. And uh, just to give a, a, a shout out for the AHDB, and uh, we haven't really seen that sort of level of, um, uh, of of information from from other European markets. Uh, so it's been easier to keep a handle of the UK market. So uh, so you know that's been good from an AHDB point. B uh, point of view doing that, but, you, but the the, uh, the figures that we have seen, there's been a, there was a 30% increase in um, fresh potato sales in March and May, uh, May in France, uh, and 25% uh, the the latest figures we've seen in in Germany, 25% uh, uh, there of retail uh, potato sales. These are um, so if we if we go on to the next one. Uh, and that has helped in France is the the uh, the French uh, potato price of their main sort of um, uh, table potato price are so really uh, pretty stable there. I mean it's it's normally pretty stable, but it's it's held stable at uh, at just over 300 uh, euros a ton, uh, and uh, that's been helped by um, uh, by strong domestic demand, but also a, a fairly strong export market for uh, French potatoes for other countries that have wanted more uh, table potatoes. So we go on to the next one. But uh, as in the UK, this the temporary closure of food surface outlets uh, across the world that's had a very big impact. Um, uh, you know, at the height of the lockdown, there were very, very few restaurants open anywhere, particularly in Europe, uh, as it went through the the worst of its uh, coronavirus cases, uh, and that has that happened also in the states. But you know, uh, markets all around the world uh, that the EU is has done very well to to capture over the last few years. A lot of those were were hit as well. So if we go on to the next one. Uh, and this is the um, uh, monthly Dutch processing potato usage figures. So the in blue, uh, the 2020 figures, 2019-20 uh, uh, or, or 20, uh, 20 figures there. And you can see we've never seen uh, anything quite like the reduction in, in processing uh, output and um, usage of potatoes uh, that we've seen uh, during April and May. I, I think this is sort of suggesting you know, we, we saw, see, start to see a bit of a recovery in, in May, but um, anecdotally, uh, the, there will be a, a greater recovery in June. Um, people have been starting to use potatoes again. Uh, so yeah, if we go on to the next one. So yeah, we had an unexpected surplus. Um, coronavirus hit, and uh, the shutdown of food service, and really the the, the suspension of the free buy market uh, across the main. Um, uh, European markets for processing potatoes in particular uh, and at one point there were estimates uh, 1 million tonnes of unsold and uncontracted uh, Dutch uh, potatoes, 750,000 tonnes of unsold Belgian potatoes and half a million tonnes in both France and Germany uh, and France, uh, sorry there's uh, support schemes have been uh, announced in France, Flanders and Netherlands, Netherlands includes sort of guaranteed price of 50 euros a tonne, so really sort of holding our market up there. Um, might be a bit of division in, in Belgium where the, the, the Flemish farmers got the uh, support uh, and the Wallonians didn't. Um, 
so yeah it's, it's we're, we're not the only uh uk is not the only country that uh divided into 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 these different parts in, in europe belgium is very much as well um but then we saw the resumption of the free bar sales sort of in late may uh, and also an increased usage of potatoes for animal feed and ad and industrial redu uh, usage and that has re uh, reduced the surplus uh, and it could mean uh, now that most of the crop will be cleared by autumn, uh, particularly as um, the um, uh, plantings of uh, early potatoes for the processing market have uh, they've re been reduced significantly this year. Uh, so so uh, the, the main crop or the larger part of the crop won't come on stream until a little bit later. So giving a chance to um, to, to to clear some of that. Uh, so I think really we're now into into sort of free buy stocks. Most of the contracting contracting stocks have gone in in, in Europe. Um, so so that uh, eating into those stocks now. Um, and as I say, some taken off the market as well. Uh, yeah, if we can have the next one. And uh, yeah, the, the, the uh, really the European market, especially uh, Netherlands and Belgium, very much rely on the export market to the rest of the world. Uh, Belgium exporting about 2.5 million tonnes of, uh, of fries um, from, from the country through to the EU, rest of the EU and, uh, and beyond. Um, so, so yeah, if we have the next slide. So these are our sort of analysis of the um, monthly EU5 exports and EU5 being uh, Belgium, Netherlands, France, Germany and uh, Poland in, in this case, uh, the main um, fry exporters. Uh, and we saw very strong, strong sales in the, in the eight months from August uh, 2019. Um, and Really, I think even with um, a sort of significant or probably a, a, a drop, we're going to see about uh, over year, year for year from August to July, we'll probably only see a, a reduction of about 3% uh, on our, and even if you saw um, there was a drop uh, of around about 30% in exports in April, and even if we see that for the last three months of the year, that would only mean a sort of seasonal decline of less than 10%. Uh, and I think that that's, um, we're not expecting such a big decline in that. So it's probably only going to be about, around about three to four, certainly less than 5% um, uh, decrease in EU fry uh, exports. And as I say, that's the largest uh, and most significant um, product that's, that's exported by the EU. So if we're on to the next one. Uh, and uh, just, just from a UK point of view, uh, UK fry inputs were down in, in, in April, uh, but that could in, in, increase now. We've seen the re, uh, reopening. And also we do have to, we have the, the fact that probably the HMRC figures are actually lower um, than the uh, corresponding export figures from the main suppliers, particularly uh, Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, and, and also we do have to throw Brexit into the mix. We can't forget Brexit. Uh, and uh, there was some sort of hangover from the, um, uh, the Brexit, the on-off Brexit that we had. Um, so there was a bit of stockpiling before that. So that probably has had an impact as well, but probably most of the impact in April was um, because of the uh, shutdown in the, in the food service sector. So we, we didn't see a great flood of imports coming in, which is, uh, which is good news. So on to the next one. And uh, within this sort of very um, uh, frenzied trading uh, environment, there are, there are complaints amongst significant, um, significant uh, buyers of EU fries that uh, EU um, is, is dumping effectively uh, or, or sending an um, um, un, uh, underpriced uh, product to, to, to the markets and Australians and New Zealanders have been very concerned about that. And actually even the Americans as well. The, the, um, the EU in the last year or so has um, supplied about 100,000 tons of French fries to the, to the US. Uh, so the US is getting quite concerned about that. Um, uh, so we could see we 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 are to in, in and I think we're in into an environment where sort of trade disputes are going to come at much more important. And we'll, obviously we'll see that with Brexit as well. I'm not talking about Brexit today, but, um, but you know that will be a significant uh, issue. So the next one. 
Uh, this is uh, just just a little uh, one on the EU uh, where, where exports uh, and imports. Um, uh, so pretty similar to last year. I mean, where, where exports were actually down on 2019, um, but imports were pretty similar. And I think we have to, you know, this is more based on the market. This isn't. Uh, this is uh, just just availability of potatoes really, uh, and, and that's probably within the sort of long term norms. Uh, a little bit affected by COVID, but not significantly. So if we uh, move on to the next one, uh, and yeah, just just really confirming that the French ex where exports were, were were little change from where they had been uh, last year. Uh, next one. So yeah, what's had uh, the effect on COVID nineteen had on EU plantings? And I think just two words: uh, very little. Uh, it seems that uh, a lot of uh, growers had the potatoes there, uh, and despite uh, being in the uh, in very much in the in the centre of the storm when they were planting, uh, they carried on planting as much as they had been. I think you know contract. Uh, there will be some uh, cutting back on contract, uh, but I, I think others thought, well, you know, the table market's been very strong, so so let's put potatoes into the ground. Uh, whether that will come back to haunt some potato growers who are not on contracts who got free buy, uh, if there is an oversupply, uh, we'll wait and see. So the next one. Yeah, so German area up about 2%, uh, French area up about 1.5%, Belgian area up a little bit, uh, Polish area, big uh, increase in the Polish area. Uh, Poland had a big drought last year in their potatoes. Uh, they were having another drought until the heavens opened and they haven't really stopped uh, raining. So uh, we should be careful what we wish for if we're still a bit worried about the drought, uh, that the uh, the heavens can open. Um, uh, Dutch area last week saying down, that down 2.3. Uh, and of course, we've heard about the uh, UK area being down a little bit. So just as, um, perhaps from a British and a Dutch point of view, perhaps some of the growers have been a little bit more tuned to the market than, than perhaps elsewhere, uh, but we'll wait, wait and see. So next one. Uh, this is just our uh, figures, assuming sort of no, uh, the, the, the assuming uh, this was actually uh, done before um, the, the, some of the figures came out last week. Uh, so we're sort of assuming a slight, and really those those figures don't uh, change change that much. Um, we are sort of assuming a, 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 a an inc slight increase in the EU5, EU5 being Germany, France, uh, Netherlands, Belgium, and UK in this instance. Uh, and the EU similar to, to, to last year. Um, so uh, again, the market, whether it can absorb that um, as hopefully is the uh, sales in retail uh, are, are higher than the, uh, the long-term average and some of the food service starts to come back, that will be interesting. Just on a point of that, uh, looking further, further afield, the US market, um, it has uh, US figures. They, they, they're, they're plantings down about 5%, and some of their processing potato um, planting might be down as much as 10%. So they, there's been a big change in the market there, and they've actually um, they, they're then actually now quite worried about being a big shortage. Whereas back in March, you know, there was um, you know potatoes were, were were going unsold and being uh, uh, dumped or, or or sent to food banks and whatever. So uh, globally. Uh, and particularly in that US market, they're, they're, they're quite concerned that they, they, their sales, because a lot of their food service sales has, have come back despite sort of fresh locks, lockdowns, but they're finding that um, a very sort of convenient food in terms of frozen fries and if people are eating out as they do in quick service restaurants and whatever, then the fries are a really good option for that. Uh, and again, uh, increased sales in the uh, in the retail sector as well. So if we go on to the next one, uh, and yeah, so this is just a, so our, our, our assumptions assumptions on the uh, uh, on the production there in the EU. So as I say, slightly up on the EU five, and uh, more or less the same for the total total EU. Uh, right, so next one. And yeah, we've seen there has been a, an effect on the price with the uh, the announcements of fairly large potato areas. So that dark blue line there, that's the um, April 2021 futures 
processing contract uh, sort of started around about 100 euros a ton. It's now uh, sort of seeing just before it came on air, it's around about 75 euros a ton. So it's going up and down. It's actually a proxy for the weather forecast. I always wind the futures price. Um, if, if, you know, we had the rain in the last couple of weeks and the uh, price started to come down and then a little bit more um, talk about uh, hotter and drier weather across Europe. It goes up again, uh, and uh, then some showers forecast, and it's gone down again. Um, but I, 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 for me personally, uh, we could see that that line going up if we see um, uh, more sort of intensification of a drought across the main uh, EU areas. Um, and uh, there has been great sort of concern after you know the wettest winter, followed by the dry spring, uh, some rain, um, but there's still there is still the the, uh, the possibility of a uh, a, a, a quite a large scale a drought uh, holding holding back yields and production. So uh, uh, and then if we see a return to um, some food service sales, particularly around the world as well, and higher um, higher retail sales. Uh, then we could be in for a tighter market, and that blue line could be going north. Uh, so, yeah, uh, on to the next one. So, I just want to say thank you, and also uh, to give a plug to our new um, uh, podcast, Planet Potato. If you're looking for market insight, it's not really the best place to come, but if you're looking for uh, very pretentiously seeing the world through the prism of the potato, uh, that's where you want to, to be. So we're, we're just looking really at uh, celebrating the potato, the culture of the potato. We've, we, we've uh, gone to a potato hotel in Germany virtually uh, and various other things. And we we have a special guest coming up in a uh, episode coming up soon, which is Mr. Potato Head. Uh, so, um, yeah, you can you can find it on your normal uh, podcast suppliers or, 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 or follow the link there. Any questions, then please uh, feel free to, to contact me um, directly. Thank you very much. That's brilliant, Cedric. Thanks very much. That uh, podcast sounds right at my alley. Um, keep the questions coming in. And as I say, we'll go through them uh, after we've had a chance to talk to Nicola. Um, but for now, I will, if I can make the slides work, I'll hand over to Nicola. Thanks very much. Hi, um, I'm Nicola Dodd, a marketing manager. Um, been in the AHDB for over 10 years now. And um, I just want to talk to you about uh, the marketing campaign that we've been running uh, in response to COVID um, just recently. Next slide, please. Um, so as you saw from Alice's uh, presentation um, and then Cedric's empty pictures of empty shelves of potatoes, at the beginning of uh, lockdown or prior to lockdown, people stockpiled their potatoes um there was you know mountains of potatoes and so in actual fact um on our social channels um one of the most popular posts that we had was um one about how to store potatoes which had about ten thousand likes and shares on across our facebook and instagram so there was there was lots of people who had potatoes at home but it was then what we needed to do is make sure that the, that we maintain the demand after this initial stockpile and also to make sure that, that it was maintained going forward. So it's not just about short term demand and trying to make up for the losses in food service, but about um, bringing potatoes to the forefront of consumers' minds and getting them to, to see potatoes in a positive way in the long term and changing their behaviours to try and get them um, to increase demand in retail um, going forward. So we need to come up with a campaign that was relevant to what their needs um, were at the time. Um, so we looked at um, social listening, so seeing what people were talking about on social media, um, did some research as well, and also asked people on our own social channels on Facebook and Instagram what they were wanting. And it came up that people were wanting tips on storage initially, um, but then also basics on how to cook uh, boiled potatoes, mashed potatoes, roast potatoes. They were wanting e easy recipe ideas. And um, from re research, it, it showed that people, like Alice was saying, people are scratch cooking a lot more. They're more interested in cooking. The meal times became a focus of the day. Um, and so people were looking for a bit of variety in terms of their recipes. And um, so we needed to respond um, with a campaign that, that met these needs. So the first thing we need to do is provide information that would help them. So tips, like I said, tips, how to's, recipes, and then also remind people about the positives of potatoes. You know, potatoes are a great product 
and sometimes get forgotten. They're seen as, seen as a staple product, but maybe not quite as versatile as perhaps rice or pasta or, or, or forgotten a little bit. So we need to make sure that in our messaging that we get across that um, they're really tasty, that they're versatile, so they can be used in a number of different dishes, not just as a side, but um, a key ingredient in main dishes, traditional dishes, but also lots of modern modern day dishes, different um, cuisines, different tray bakes, one pots, etc. Um, that they're easy and also that they're nutritious as well. Um, and really with our content, we need to make sure that people are inspired by recipes. So they want to go and try new recipes. They want to um, see recipes that would be relevant to them and their lifestyles and their the flavors that they like and the tastes they have. Um, so really serving them some a variety of content. And then there's also um, at the back of the heads, there's, there's different people here, different things. So there's lots of myths out there that, um, you know, that it's, carbs are bad for you, um, uh, potatoes are fattening, etc. And so we need to dispel some of these myths and um, talk about the positives of, um, of uh, potatoes. Looking at research, health wasn't a priority in lockdown. I think people were just turning to comfort food and... Uh, not really be bothered quite so much about health but we have seen actually that recently as we're coming towards the end of lockdown that health has become a more important feature and I think maybe perhaps people want to get into those genes rather than just those stretchy waistbands and so health has sort of triggered um, a, an increase in demand um, again and so we we want to make sure that people know the positives of potatoes so the fact that they're gluten-free, fat-free, salt-free um, a great source of fiber and potassium etc so we need to make sure that our messages are varied in terms of inspirational and then supporting with some health messages so really our ideal is to try and get people to add an extra potato meal to their weekly repertoire to really grow demand in the longer term so in terms of a marketing campaign it's it's making sure that we've got some content that appeals to people at the time um, and at the place that they're thinking about recipe inspiration and um, and when they're wanting to to um, come with up with new ideas. Next slide, please. So we decided to bring Bud the Spud back. So Bud um, was uh, the the lead character in our marketing campaign um, for three years in a row. That was from 2015 to 2018. Um, over which period, at which time we um, saw an increase in sales and frequency. Uh, during campaign periods and um, we also had a really good response to uh, the cheeky chappy but spud and his suggestive uh, meal ideas so we had feedback from the different um, campaign bursts that the campaign featuring him which was titled uh, more than a bit on the side was impactful memorable amusing and so um, we thought this was a central character that we can tap into again also the messaging in the in the campaign that was used before um, shifted attitudes. So we had key measurements that we wanted to to um, to, to watch, and then over the period to see if they had uh, moved, shifted in the right direction. And each of the sentiments around versatility, ease, taste, relevance, and health all saw a shift in the in the positive. So um, obviously the the messaging within the campaign hit the mark as well. Um, and then for this time round, obviously we wanted to respond as quickly as we could. Um, we had a hundred thousand pounds and um, and that's not a lot of money if you have to start off with a brand new campaign, new creative, do all the testing. And obviously it takes a while. So we had a um, campaign that had been tried and tested before, um, proven to be a success. So um, Bud the Spud saw his comeback. Next slide, please. So in terms of um, what we need to do to focus on the campaign, obviously we wanted to drive inspiration and also demonstrate versatility for potatoes. Um, so we needed to come up with the, the media plan of, of who we wanted to talk to, when, how we we're going to talk to them and what we were going to say. So we were targeting an audience of households with children, but also those who um, are receptive. So who are already um, cooking carbs so would that be potatoes fresh or frozen pasta or rice so we want them to choose obviously potatoes um, more often 
When are we wanting to talk to them? Well, a number of different times, basically at, at discoverable moments when they're looking for lockdown meal inspiration. So people tend to, I think people have been thinking about food an awful lot in uh, lockdown. So when whether they're um, watching food content on uh, TV or on social, um, whether they're writing their, sh their weekly shopping list and then, uh, or whether they're actually in the store or prior to entering the short store, we want to make sure that we are um, basically there the whole whole time through, uh, through that consumer journey of thinking about food and then, um, then purchasing it. In terms of choosing the channels that um, we advertised in, um, we wanted to have a combination of some big hitting channels, um, and then some um, more engaging channels. So there was a mix to really make people stop and look at the advertising, but then also to um, be a bit more relevant and a bit more uh, narrative with the individuals on a level that they um, see and trust. And then in terms of the, the content, as I said, Bud the Spud campaign, we already had in the bag, and we've also got um, over 150 recipes on our website as well. So really it was about using the content we've got uh, a mixture of bud the spud content to really sort of drive drive um humor and stand out some recipes to inspire and then underlining that some health messages as well to give people a bit of re reassurance that potatoes are a healthy healthy choice so we looked at all the content we've got refreshed it and then chose um different parts of the the campaign and um developed our um an eight-week campaign which started um initially just with some social on May the 25th and then continues through to the end of July. Next slide, please. So um, the first part was um, a three week campaign um, uh, on TV. So it was on Catch Up TV um, from the 8th of, 8th of June to the 29th of June. And um, a great thing about being in lockdown is that um, on catch up TV, normally you might watch watch your catch up on your mobile device or on your um, tablet or on the TV. In fact, most most of the people watch it about 50, 60 percent watch on TV. In lockdown, we saw about 80 percent watching on TV, I think. And that means also we can reach more people because the whole families are gathered around the TV together. And so um, but the spot in previous campaigns had only ever been on YouTube. But now we got to got to be on the big screen. So if you can play the um, advert, please. Okay, so um, so Bud's cheeky character um, has proven in the past to uh, grab attention and amuse, and then we've got the foodie, the foodie end frame and the audio that um, really then sort of gives the inspiration bit towards the end, and um, and the uh, the website lapotatoes.co.uk to drive people through to the website to um, um, continue their journey. So. Um, so we, we um, put him on ITV, which was um, a big hitting, obviously, um, uh, channel and had some big shows on there. So some of the bigger shows that he, he was on was Britain's Got Talent, Coronation Street, Emmerdale, The Chase, Love Island, Australia for the for the younger um, uh, viewers. Um, so really, there was some big shows to um, add credibility and scale to the campaign. And then there's also some foodie foodie fo um, programs as well. Um, that were really relevant. So when people were actually looking out for um, foodie content and inspiration. Um, and we also make sure that we upweighted the advert to certain times of the day. So um, upweighted to lunchtime so when people were thinking about their food for later on, early evening when perhaps they were um, writing their shopping list and, and the same at the end of the, end of the week when they're uh, uh, visiting stores. Uh, next, next slide, please. So if um, people in lockdown, if they weren't at home watching TV or on social, then they were probably stood in queues outside the supermarket. So we made sure that we were advertising in all those places. So we had um, digital posters outside Tesco, Asda and Sainsbury's um, for two weeks, two 
one week burst, the week went in the first and then the 15th of June. And these were, um, we had three different designs, um, bird featured in each of them, different recipe dishes, but slightly different messages. So one, um, one was a versatility message, so it had five different uh, dishes to show that um, inspire in different ways. One was a, more of a convenience message, so on the table in 20 minutes, so in, um, ease and speed. And then one was a health messages uh, saying that it was um, fat free. So each of the each of the core messages were across the um, the posters and uh, Bud's cheeky uh, character on there and some nice enticing recipe meals. So this was all really to drive inspiration, create standout and encourage obviously volume sales just as people were about going into store. So they'd, they'd seen the, um, the advert on, on the television or um, social as I'll go on to. And then just as they are waiting outside the store. So we made, certainly made the most of COVID queues um, to try and gauge them where they're just queuing outside just before their point of, um, of purchase. Uh, next slide, please. So I said, um, we've had TV, we've had some um, posters, and then un underpinning all that, um, we've had um, social, which runs through the whole of the campaign. So we've been advertising on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. And uh, we've done that in three different ways. So one has been by putting some paid support behind our own posts. So we have got a really great group of followers on both our Facebook and Instagram channels. We've got um, 217,000 followers on Facebook and 32,000 on Instagram, um, which we've built up over the last 10 years. And so um, when, we, when we, we have a calendar of content that goes out throughout the year, um, but what we did this time is made sure we put some uh, money behind those posts to make sure that they reach as many people out of those followers as possible. So it's it's talking to a, an engaged group of people who are already um, interested and cooked with potatoes, but just to give them some additional inspiration. The second um, way we reached out through um, social was to target new consumers. So not current um, followers, but people within the um, social media that were interested in cooking and potatoes. So we could target quite specifically those that were, were more keen on, on, on carbs and cooking. And then the third group were through influencers, which you may or may not know. Um, youngsters um, just follow social media all the time and just follow people who they aspire to, who they trust, um, treat like peers, um, whether they're fitness or foodie or just a celebrity or whoever they are on, influ um, on social media, but people follow um, follow these guys and so we've we um, have paid influencers to create their own contents their own recipes they put a post out that talks about taste versatility health etc um, and then we basically um, expand our reach to, to their followers so there was three three um, three routes and we use different content so on the right you can see that that was um, a snapshot of the grid that we've got on Facebook oh, sorry Instagram so there's a mixture of different posts there, some with bird, some with recipes, some with videos, some with health messages to give a real um, variety of messages throughout the whole campaign. And the idea is to get serve people with videos to really inspire and then follow that up with um, Im more images to really drive people through to the website. So where they encourage them to click through and then the influencers, as I said, to, um, to, to have their own user generated content so, to make it homely and see what other people are doing with potatoes. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a, a few slides of um, what the content we've been putting out. So as I said, we've got some bird content, recipe content, um, some how to's that was a post on how to microwave potatoes, which um, was really, really popular. And then the bottom three posts were ones from the influencers, so those ones that um, they've created themselves, which um, are just really inspiring and um, look delicious. Uh, next slide, please. And then we've also, um, just to, to make sure that no one was being left out, we've made sure that all the different sectors and formats of potatoes are included. So we've had um, where we can, if there's, the, if there's frozen alternatives to fresh um, fresh ingredients, then we have. So if there's recipes that we say, if you want a shortcut or um, for cheap, then then use the frozen wedge rather than creating your own or whatever it may be. So we've had, um, we've also been 
talking about promoting um, frozen alternatives, particularly, I think, with people getting a little bit fed up and, and um, bored with doing st um, scratch cooking all the time. They are wanting, to, we've seen an increase in people having, um, turning to assisted and assembled cooking. So, so look at using kits, sauces, um, frozen accompaniments. So um, in our posts, if there are alternatives, we've used them. And we haven't left out um, the chip shops, the love of chip shops we've referred to in um, posts where, as and when they've opened and not forgetting crisps. So, so we've, we've had all formats basically in, in our posts. Uh, next slide, please. And these are just a few of the top performing ones. So um, on Facebook, um, we've basically, they're the, the best performing in terms of engagement rate. So engagement rate are, um, are mess, uh, shares, likes, comments on social media, and then um, clicks are click through, click throughs to our um, website. So number one for Facebook was roast potato, how to cook roast potatoes. Dauphinoise was popular Facebook and Instagram. I think people missing going to restaurants and having that nice comfort food. So they're wanting to recreate it in their home. Um, the soup went well, moussaka, um, frittata. So there was a range of different dishes, um, but also all of these well, predominantly have been above um, industry average. So the industry average for an engagement rate is between one to three percent. So you can see here these are like 12 percent, 11 percent, 9 percent, and even the ones on Instagram um, are around the three percent mark. So all of them have been really positively received. Uh, next slide, please. And these are just a few comments we've had. So um, you won't be able to see them there, so I'll just read a few out. But it's, we've had lots of comments say, yes, they look lovely, we're going to try the dish. Lots of people tagging other people in as well. So saying to their friends, have you seen this? This looks lovely, um, which helps to expand the reach further because then their, um, their followers um, see those posts. Um, and also some people have come back and, you know, a week or two later saying, I've tried the recipe, it was lovely. And so it's been really nice to see a good mixture of, um, of, of, of comments out there. Next slide, please. And as I said, some of the key metrics for the campaign is to try and direct people to the website so that people are then inspired to look at all the other, uh, other recipes we've got on there. There's over 150 recipes, hints, tips, videos. Um, and, and since the start of the campaign, over 132,000 people have looked at our website, uh, looking at over 231,000 pages. So it's it's a really good way of, of engaging with people. The um, the top content, um, funny enough, from the post as well is dauphinoise. Um, and then with second is a moussaka recipe, third an orange cake, fourth a soup, and fifth a cod dish. So you can see that um, if we're out there trying to demonstrate versatility, then just looking at the top five. Um, recipes that people are clicking onto. There are sort of a huge variety in there. And then as you drop down, the seventh, eighth, and nine are all hints and tips on how to. So, like I said, the microwave one was popular, cooking chips at home, boiling potatoes. So we've had a real good mix, and it's demonstrated that um, there's a there's people are wanting variety. And then next slide, please. This is the my last slide. So the campaign is still running till the end of July. Um, we haven't got all the, um, the measures in yet for uh, the video on demand and the out of home, but social tends to, uh, you can see the res results quite quickly as we go through. So I've just got a few stats here for you. So, so far we've, with the campaign, we've reached uh, 1.9 million people. Um, we've delivered 3.4 million impressions. So that's how many times the, the different adverts have been served to people. Um, and the plan was 4.3 million. So we're not too far off and we've only spent 40% of the money. So that's looking really positive. Um, we've had over a million video views um, and over 18,000 link clicks. So we've already, already um, well exceeded the video views and the link clicks, which is just brilliant. So I think that shows that people are um, really positively responding to the to the content they like the content and it's making them click through to find out more and want to be inspired and see what else is on the website as i said the engagement rate has been really great as well with an average of one to three percent um anything above three percent is amazing so we've got with our average on facebook's been 6.72 and and uh, 2.88 on instagram so 
um, really good stats there, and 95% uh, positive or over 95% positive sentiment, which is great. I think a few people debated um, the ingredients in the moussaka because we, we veered away from traditional lamb and aubergine with beef and potato, but there were loads of positives as well. So it's nice to have the engagement and the comments and, and the interactions with people. So, so it's looking really good and it's carrying on until the end of July. So hopefully you've, some of you have seen the content um, in your feeds or out and about. Or if you're not, then don't worry, you might not be the target audience. <laughs> so, so lots of people will have seen it. And that's me. Thanks, Amber. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Nicola. Okay, um, I'm just going to invite our speakers back to join us. Um, and David from the market intelligence team has joined us as well. Uh, I've got a list of questions. Um, if you've got any more questions, keep putting them through and uh, they'll keep getting sent to me. So I'll read them out. Don't worry, I won't miss you off. Um, and we'll just get started with the first question that I've got, which is for Alice. Uh, so it is, um, how has the retail performance of potatoes compared to other carbs, uh, notably rice and pasta? Oh, sorry, my mic won't turn back on. Um, that is something that I don't have the answer to right this second, um, because that is something our retail team would have looked into. Our update for um, retail sales, which does look into the split of carbohydrates, is due out this month. Um, that's my wrong way in the month. It will be due out in the next two weeks. Um, as of the, I'm just trying to see if I can find it quickly. Um, no, unfortunately, we don't. So the 12 week ending up to the 19th of May will be due onto the website in the next, well, it should be next week, I believe, um, to have a look at that. So I'm really sorry, but I can't answer that one. That's okay, Alice. We can always make uh, the links to the pages where you can find the information when it's updated available with the recording to this. Um, so don't worry, we will find the answer for you and get back to you uh, in, in, in a little while. Uh, so the next question I've got um, is, with so many potatoes left in Europe, uh, are we likely to see uh, a mass import of cheap uh, potatoes? So maybe one for Cedric. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, I, I think I think a lot of the stocks are starting to be cleared, and there is um, there is some sort of optimism that there won't be a, 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 such a big carryover as as first feared uh, going into the new season. I think I think it, it depends. Um, we UK is a, a, a very important and largest well largest market for uh, Belgian and um, Dutch. Uh, processors, uh, so it, it is a big sort of target market. But um, you know, the growth the growth has been elsewhere, uh, and there is sort of evidence that those other markets are holding up. Uh, so it is a threat. Um, uh, the, the cost of uh, the uh, fries imports that you know that they, they are lower priced imports, so there is that sort of threat. Um, we do have you know Brexit sort of might. Um, upset the the pomme de terre cart um, as as we as we look in the um, uh, next few months, um, uh, and which actually could see you know if we have a no deal Brexit, then there, were, there, there is potentially have, um, import tariffs of around about 14% uh, on on EU fries. Uh, so that might actually st um, uh, mean less imports, but. Uh, I, I, my sort of feeling is that uh, there might be some more pressure, but uh, I can't see a great big uh, influx. Brilliant. Thanks, Cedric. Um, I've got another one for the MI team and Cedric. So uh, if we're looking at a potential surplus with next year's crop as well, uh, where do you think export markets could come from and what would be the impact of Brexit on this? David, do you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, well, I was, um, I suppose, coming from the Brexit angle, really, um, that's the key thing. And 
you know, across all ranges of commodities, you know, we're still at a risk whether we're going to have restrictions into um, EU markets um, from January onwards. Um, you know, we still need to get third country equivalents for potatoes, and that's going to cause an issue. Um, so it may restrict our um, our ability to to export somewhat. Um, I guess the thing is, really, if we're talking about exporting. You know, we're looking like, from what Cedric was saying, that there's going to be a relatively oversupplied market um, if we end up with um, reasonable yields across the European scale. So, you know, we're looking at what would probably be a very competitive and very low value market. And I think that needs to be taken into consideration as well, that, you know, exports don't necessarily save the day because you're only exporting anything in any great volume when you have a surplus. And that will mean that prices will be um, will be you know, relatively low on the historical side of things. So, you know, from an export point of view, um, you know, there'll always be opportunities, but we've got to take into account the fact that, you know, we, we're going to be selling into a competitive market and uh, we're probably going to be selling into a slightly um, disadvantageous market because of the uh, you know, future trading rules that we may see with, uh, with the EU. So um, I wouldn't see the export market as anything that's going to ride in at the last minute and, and, and save the domestic potato markets. It's probably more something to ensure that we can clear out any larger surpluses that we build from this year's production. And I think, I mean, I think the home market as well is, is, is important. And I think we can be, uh, you know, that's been good, the, the, the extra sales and pretty significant extra sales in, into the retail sector. And if we can keep some of that, um, increase as people then start to go out to the food service sector as well um you know i think perhaps is this an opportunity to to re uh, um uh, to, to show people that you know how, how valuable the potato is as a good value uh, versatile um source of uh, source of food uh, and you know, frozen as well can be sort of um, put in the free, uh, freezer and left in the freezer and used when when you, when you need it. Um, so, uh, and as a versatile food service ingredient as well. So, I think you know, there perhaps perhaps there will be more opportunities to be selling it in the UK. Um, but as as David says, some surplus uh, elsewhere. Uh, and and I think you know the, these sort of trends of uh, people revaluing the potato, if you like, they are perhaps global ones. Uh, we've seen it in places like India and uh, uh, across across the world. Um, so you know it's probably for the whole potato industry to um, to, 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 to to then sort of build on on the uh, people falling back in love with the potato, if you like. And I think um, sort of further to that point, you know, thinking sort of longer term, you know, we sort of following off from I think what, um, what Alice was saying as well, you know, we're heading into a, you know, it's going to be a relatively prolonged recessionary period that does change consumers buying habits. So, you know, we're probably going to be moving away from, you know, um, sort of packaged potato gratins and dauphinoise and those kind of things and moving more towards more of a, um, I don't want to use the word simple diet in a, in a derogatory sense but more of a sort of classical diet shall we say um and therefore like you said cedric that, that does bring opportunities um i think you know, like most things there will be areas that will benefit from it and there will be areas that will still unfortunately see a level of oversupply um just depends on the the sector that we're in in the regional production and more importantly how the weather plays out over the next few weeks brilliant thank you um, with EU growers set up to grow predominantly uh, processing potatoes, do you see there being an opportunity for uh, fresh potato exports from the UK to Europe to help with their table market, especially if we go into sort of a second uh, lockdown period? Yeah, I, th I mean, there is there is that potential. Um, I think a lot of countries, though, have... Um, Perhaps increase their potato, their table potato area, or at least sort of held steady. So a lot of that increase you will have seen in France and Germany and places like that, who are big users of, of fresh potatoes. That will have been in the uh, in the fresh um, side. So, 
Um, so perhaps we have actually seen reductions in the processing area um, that are hidden in those figures. So, you know, there might actually be more potential um, uh, in, in the processing side. Um, Eastern Europe uh, has been buying potatoes, it's still a big uh, consumers of, of, of potatoes there. Um, and uh, yeah, and I suppose, you know, the UK, is in, in a good position in some ways that it can, you know, it's got its ports and it can export. Um, but um, but uh, perhaps, uh, yeah, I don't want to overplay the um, the potential for, uh, for table markets uh, elsewhere. But, uh, you know, we, we never know what the market is. Uh, and we have had years where UK has had some some strong demand, uh, particularly at the end of the season, to, to, to fill in any any, any gaps. So as David says, yeah, much depends on the weather in the next couple of months. Probably that's in some ways that's the most important thing. Um, um, perhaps even more important than uh, more COVID cases. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I've got a question for Nicola, which is, um, what is the market penetration for potatoes uh, in the UK? Sure. I don't know off the top of my head. I know it's larger than... Uh some of the, the other competitors oh 95 percent they do know um right give me a second to find my next question uh so what are the realistic best and worst case scenarios for growers over the next 12 months in the opinions of the, spe uh, the speakers uh, specific to market and consumer demand just a simple one for you all Do you want me to go first, Amber? <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I, I suppose you can play this two ways. You can go down the flippant route of going, well, best case scenario is, you know, um, the world reopens in a normal sense over the next three months, and before you know it, we're, you know, pulling up main crop, and the world is as it was um, in October last year, but without the rain from our point of view, obviously. Um, uh, you know, that it's it's one of those things where you can put as much of a sort of um, forecast on it and build assumptions around it and um, give a view. But realistically, you know, the world in general, across all commodity markets and, and, and all, all agricultural markets, is still kind of feeling its way through this process and still very wary of any um, future shocks that we see either from coronavirus or weather. So there's those two key factors that come into it. From a, from a domestic production point of view, um, yeah, we, I think it was Alice was saying, you know, with average yields, you end up with a 5.4 million ton crop. You know, that's sufficient for what we need. That covers everything. In some cases, because of the way the um, the market is structured, that may be slightly too much, and we end up with slight areas of uh, of, of oversupply. Um, so, worst case scenario is we end up with a six million ton crop, realistically, and we've got to find somewhere to market it. Um, you know, best case scenario, you know, we end up with a balanced domestic supply and demand from what Cedric was saying that we are producing everything that we need um, and you know that helps to keep us in a position where we're supplying enough um, that we are keeping our local demand happy without the need to move to those import markets that could you know potentially be oversupplied elsewhere so um, it's you know, realistically we're not going to be able to give a, a more definitive answer to that than where we are in a couple of months and sort of how the, the global economy in general is sort of recovering and how quickly people get back to, you know, more normal purchasing habits and more normal buying habits and, and eating out that kind of thing. I suppose from my point of view, I mean, the, the, the optimistic um, that uh, potatoes have showed their resilience over, over COVID-19 and, you know, people have been buying them. And I think, actually, I think the, um, the increase in, in retail sales has been as much or slightly more than than general food um particularly for, for for fresh potatoes so i think you know that there is that um that that uh, opportunity to, to sell more into 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 that market um and i suppose also optimistically you know globally yeah europe might be a little bit oversupplied but um if north america is undersupplied then that will sort of tighten tighten the market um might, might take some of that european surplus out and that which, which then might um ripple through to the uk um pessimistically 
Uh, I suppose, yeah. Now, uh, pessimists, if we, if we get the perfect weather, then uh, and we have massive yields uh, across Europe. Um, I always sort of hate to say, you know, pessimistically, if the weather is perfect, then it's all doom and gloom. Uh, always very difficult to explain that to non-agricultural audiences. Um, but, um, but you know, the, the pessimistically, if we, if, if we do get very, uh, sort of very, very large crops across across Europe, then I think we are uh, we could have a, a, a very difficult um, season, particularly if um, if demand for food service demand doesn't doesn't come back. Uh, and I think it's very important. I think for probably the British growers, as I alluded to, British growers have probably been more responsive to um, and erring the side of caution than, than than others elsewhere. And I think you know that's perhaps that I don't want to say more sophisticated, but you know, perhaps more more clued into the market um, than than. Than, than elsewhere and not sort of just growing because we've always grown or we've got the seed to grow it. Um, uh, and they have sort of responded a bit to the, to the market. So, you know, I think that we need to be encouraging that um, response into the longer term. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, one that sits quite nicely, I guess, uh, on the back of those answers uh, is what is the likelihood of a long-term rise in fresh potato consumption in this country uh, as a result of lockdown. Sorry, what was the start of that number? Uh, sorry, what's the likelihood of a long-term rise in fresh potato consumption? I think um, going back to the sort of recessionary behaviour, sort of stuff that I touched upon near the end of that, like we. Well, we've all sort of alluded to potatoes are seen as quite good value for money um, in terms of selling products. So I think in terms of short to medium term, at least, we're likely to see that rise in demand from retail continue. Um, but it's still likely that the food service side of stuff, I think potatoes will continue to be a dominant factor within food service. But it's whether that food service sort of sector is available still. I also think, I mean, um, you know, in the long term, uh, it's the uh, we 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 cover it in our Planet Potato podcast. What what you can do with a potato is an extraordinary thing. It's you know you can make plastic out of it. You can make different chemicals. You can get proteins out of it that that are probably um, don't want to dis, dis dairy with the HDB covering dairy as well, but um, sort of um, that have proteins which can be replicate with some of what the, some of the dairy proteins do. Um, there's a whole manner of things, and as as we as we perhaps sort of change our, our our emphasis and we look for alternatives for plastics and we look for climate change uh, crops uh, and 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 whatever you know the, and, and then the yields of potatoes being much higher than other um, competitive crops uh, and so they're better users of water and land and carbon and and whatever um, you know the the the, the the, the long-term potential for for the potato is is probably is as great as it's ever been, and I think you know it's probably uh, up to us in the industry to try and capitalise on that. Brilliant, positive then going forward. Um, we're almost out of time, so I've just got one more question for Nicola. Uh, if Bud is going back to bed at the end of July after doing such a such a good job, uh, what's next, and should Bud make a permanent reappearance? Uh, good question. Um, I, we'll have to see because you do get um, an element of campaign wear out. So we'll have to sort of get a gauge of how popular he's continued to be. Um, he seems to be very popular now, but but every uh, campaign has a, a lifespan. Um, we will be looking to do some more advertising um, in a number of months time, could be at the beginning of part of next year. Um, and are discussing whether he um, he is reinvigorated, or whether um, whether we need a, a new creative stance. So there will be more marketing, but we, it's still TBC in terms of how big a, a role Bud will play. So just making sure we do the best thing really for the campaign, I guess. Yeah, um, I, I mean, it's the main things obviously are the, are the messaging, and then if he's the right character to put those messages out, and obviously. Um, our messages this time have been versatility, taste, ease, convenience, and then thinking about recessionary behaviours and maybe we want to talk about value and other things. So it's it, obviously it's important that we get the messaging right. And is he the right person to deliver it or not? It's still TBC. 
Definitely. Thanks very much, Nicola. Um, I've just been told that there's uh, hot news in from Alice, so I'm going to pass back over to you uh, to fill us in about the carbs. <laughs> <laughs> how hot news it is. But we actually do have the data from Pampar that cover 52 weeks ending. We don't have anything that covers only the lockdown period. It's something that might be able to be able to get hold of, um, but it's not something that's readily available as such. But potatoes up to um, April, end of April in 52 weeks ending make up 50% or just over 50% of the carbohydrate market. It's lost 2% since April 2019, um, so it still remained a very strong position. At the end of April um, 2019, pasta and rice together, uh, and noodles, sorry, only made up 12% of the carbohydrate market. Um, and they had risen slightly um, together, they'd risen 9% um, from the previous year at that point. There will be more data, like I say, available coming up um, with a greater breakdown of sort of where potatoes sit against specific carbohydrates like pasta and rice and noodles. But they've maintained that over 50% of the carbohydrate market. And like we've sort of alluded to, what I feel it is quite sort of potatoes do sit well um, in the sort of sales market place. So hopefully they will continue to be strong in the marketplace. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Alice. Um, I think I will end the questions there uh, as we've got to five o'clock already. Uh, just a couple of bits from me. Uh, firstly, thank you very much to our speakers. Uh, I think you've done a fantastic job, um, given us lots to think about and uh, uh, lots to go away and uh, consider this year. Um, there is going to be a short survey that pops up um, after this webinar, and if you could all fill it in, that would be really appreciated. It'll help us to uh, frame the sort of things that we're doing going forward and bring you more of what you like, um, less of what you don't. Uh, this has been recorded. If you have missed anything, if you have joined late, uh, you'll be able to get it again on the HDB Potatoes YouTube channel, so don't worry about that. These are my details. If you want anything, if you want to know any more information, please get in touch. Uh, happy to hear from you. And just to plug our upcoming webinars, we've got three more this week, as Jay mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so tomorrow is research focused. We'll be looking at uh, potato rotations, black leg management and aphids. On Wednesday, we'll be doing a uh, precision technology run through of the potato growing year. It looks to be a really interesting one. I mean, they're all going to be really interesting one, but I'm especially excited about that one. Um, and then finally, our strategic potato farmers are on on Thursday and they're going to be telling us about what's going on uh, at the strategic potato farms because unfortunately we're unable to go out and see them all this year. Um, but thank you very much for joining. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you've got something from it. And I hope that we can see you all again uh, in the coming days. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.